Hello, my name is Jim Bullock from iFormulate Limited and welcome to this presentation in the iFormulate Revisited series, where we have gone back to some of our past conference presentations with the aim of providing you with some interesting insights in the area of formulation science and technology. And this talk is based on an invited presentation originally given given at the Natural Colours Summit in 2014 and covers natural colours, how they can be stabilised and how we can learn from formulation approaches in other industries. First, a little bit of information about iFormulate. We're a company founded by two experienced ind industry professionals and we're well into our eighth year as a company. We bring our own experience and knowledge gained across many industries and in varied functional roles and combine them with the ex expertise of our associate partners, all in order to assist our clients. And we divide our activities into three business areas. In iFormulate Consult, we carry out innovation and technology consulting, mainly in formulation technology, for client companies in private sector industry. And that's the majority of our business. As I formulate strategic, we have carried out and assisted strategic pro projects in the area of formulation for sector bodies and associations such as the Knowledge Transfer Network, the National Formulation Centre and the Royal Society of Chemistry. And under I formulate skills, we design, deliver and promote training courses and programmes in formulation science and technology, which may appear under our own banner or may be in partnership with third parties. So this presentation divides into two sections. In part one, we'll be looking at stability and the definition of stability, and then we'll be going through colour and understanding and knowing your colour. We'll then move on to some other products which have stability ch challenges from other industries to see if we can learn from those. In the second part, we'll be looking at some case studies on natural colours and some specific examples of colours and, and ways of stabilising them. And then we'll be looking at some possible approaches with the pros and cons uh, and the ability to share knowledge in that area. So first of all, let's think about stability and defining stability. What is stability really? In fact, let's start by defining what instability is. And one way of defining instability is that it's a detectable, significant and undesirable change in a product's properties that occurs over a relevant time period. Now that's quite a long definition, so let's break that down a little bit. All products have desirable or undesirable properties which may change over time. And those changes may be caused by chemical or physical processes. Time itself isn't a cause, but time can magnify the change itself. So your first step in getting a handle on instability and stability is to define what is undesirable, what is detectable, what is significant, and what time period is relevant. And those are the sorts of things that you can incorporate into, for instance, your quality control specifications. Then you need to have some sort of means to measure, compare and standardise. And it also is extremely important at this time uh, to know what your customer considers to be significant or undesirable in terms of a change. So it also then follows that any change that is undetectable is insignificant or occurs over a much longer time period is actually not relevant to your consideration. So it enables you to focus on the things that are really important, this approach. And it's vital then to understand the underlying physical and chemical processes which cause that instability. Then one way of approaching that is to uh, look at possible accelerated or predictive stability testing and great advances are being made in that at the moment uh, and it's good in principle but it's not always meaningful in practice. So that's a quick run through of stability. Let's move on to understanding and knowing your colour properly. So 
So let's think about what a colorant is and why it's colored. So if you start with white light and you have a molecule that contains a chromophore, that chromophore by definition absorbs certain wavelengths in the visible spectrum. And by absorbing that wavelength or those wavelengths, it subtracts those from the light that you can see. So in the example on the bottom left, and that's the visible absorbance spectrum for cranberry juice, which contains anthocyanin, natural anthocyanin dyes. And those dyes absorb visible light with blue, green and yellow wavelengths so that the juice appears red. And just to understand that a little bit better on the visible spectrum on the right hand side, if you take the visible spectrum of white light broken down into the various different colours according to wavelength, if you're subtracting these blue, green and yellow areas from the left hand and the middle of that spectrum, you're going to be left with essentially only the red light going through uh, and, and that being visible. So that's why uh, colours can subtract and how they subtract light to give you a, a visible effect. So it's subtractive chromophore. So let's look at what's going on in the colorant molecule, the chromophore of the colorant molecule as light is absorbed or subtracted. So incident light of a specific frequency uh, lands on the chromophore and can excite electrons in the ground state of that chromophore system to an excited state. And for that reason, a specific wavelength is absorbed and that gives you then an absorption band and hence a subtraction in the spectrum of the light that you see. Uh, in addition to the chromophore of the molecule, the molecule may also contain oxychrome functional groups. And these are functional groups which can modify that absorption spectrum. And by modifying the absorption spectrum, the hue of the colorant is changed. So a bathochromic shift is one shift that occurs when absorption moves towards longer wavelengths. So your oxychrome may cause a bathochromic shift longer wavelength absorption, or it may cause a hypsochromic shift. So your, your, your oxychrome in this case uh, shifts the absorption towards shorter wavelengths and, uh, and, and therefore absorption in the blue. In addition to those functional groups, the chromophore and the oxychromes, the molecule may also contain other functional groups which confer physical properties such as solubility and compatibility and so on onto the colorant. So you might have functional groups here which were soluble in water, for instance. And the molecule then, that simplified diagram at the bottom shows you how those parts of the molecule may be put together. But molecules don't exist on their own. They exist in combination with other molecules around them. So let's look at some definitions here. Uh, and, and sometimes definitions aren't used as rigorously as they should be, and that can lead to some confusion. So a dye, and you may have heard the word dye if you've heard colorant, a dye is a specific sort of colorant molecule which is dispersed or dissolved as individual molecules in solution or substrate. And that's the upper diagram here. And those molecules for dyes are usually significantly below one nanometer in size. An aggregate is a cluster of colorant molecules, and some, sometimes colorant molecules may cluster together in aggregates of tens to hundreds, and that the size of that may then exceed a nanometer, and they may be of several nanometers in size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stacks, the word stacks is sometimes used for ordered aggregates, which have specific interactions between molecules, and that ordering can give you specific properties. And then the word pigment may be used, and the pigment isn't the same as dye. It means something completely different, or it should mean something completely different. It's a, a colorant which is dispersed as insoluble particles, tens of nanometers to tens of microns in size. And those particles contain not just a few molecules, like the stacks or the aggregates, but many thousands to many millions of molecules. And therefore, the length scale of those typically is, is as we say, below a micron to above a micron in size. And that's a pigment, so insoluble particles consisting of individual colorant molecules packed together as solids. Here's a health warning. In the word, word of natural colors, you will often come across the word pigment used for any color, irrespective of its solubility. Now, the name 
in some in some circumstances may not matter and Shakespeare wrote that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet but I actually help find it helpful to know whether a particular colour that I'm looking at is soluble or insoluble and particulate so it's best to use those definitions pigments for particulate insolubles dispersed in some sort of medium and dyes for dissolved molecules so we've talked about those particles those stacks and those aggregates so what why are they important actually well the importance comes from the fact that the absorption spectrum of a colorant or a dye may be influenced or affected by the surroundings of that molecule and one simple way in which that can happen is that the solvent surrounding or and the solvent may be water oil or an organic solvent surrounding a dye molecule can shift the absorption spectrum and that uh, feature is known as solvatochromism and on the upper right hand side you can see a diagram from the literature showing you in the case of curcumin how the absorption spectrum of that molecule and that chromophore changes with a different solvent and therefore you would expect to see the color change according to the solvent you'll see a different color for instance in water than you would in, in, in an organic solvent so that's one reason why the surroundings of a molecule are important uh, the other thing that can happen in aggregates is that the curve or the straight line that you normally see between absorption and concentration may be non-linear and that de deviates from the so-called Beer-Lambert law and that means that at high concentrations those individual molecules they're starting to aggregate together and they no longer behave independently of each other and therefore that absorb absorbance relationship may deviate from that linear one that we see at low concentrations and that deviation may be negative so you get a lower absorption than you would expect or sometimes you may see a positive deviation you get a higher absorbance than you would expect from the individual molecules on their own so if you are able to plot that line uh, absorbance against concentration absorbance is the strength of the absorption of the light um, at a particular wavelength uh, and you see the curve bending over in one way or another you know that there's, there's probably some aggregation or uh, clustering of molecules going on there another way uh, in which uh, color can be affected is quite significant in terms of color intensity and here's an example again from the literature at the top here uh, re relating to natural anthocyanin molecules and, and here you can see in the diagram that anthocyanin molecules may pack together around a central metal ion with other compounds to form a structured complex and that self-association actually causes interactions between the chromophore systems in adjacent molecules forming planar stacks and therefore actually what here happens here is an increase in the expected color intensity so that's a positive deviation from the beer lambert law that we saw on the previous slide and there are many well well known examples in the case of pigments um, that's the true meaning of pigments insoluble crystalline particles where the crystal structure or the crystal packing arrangement of molecules within that pigment can have an effect on the color of that pigment and the classical example is that of the synthetic pigment quinacridone that in very dilute solution just looks a pale yellow it's stacked together as a crystalline particle uh, it may be red but it may be violet and the difference in color then uh, is a reflection on the crystal form or the crystal morphology of, of the particles that you have there so crystal polymorphism can be important uh, and, and the color can reflect different stacking arrangements in, in the crystal At this stage let's move on to our consideration of color and some specific natural colors let's start by looking at a very common family of natural colors and that's anthocyanins these are glycosated sugar derivatives of anthocyanidin six of these anthocyanidins and 400 anthocyanins have been identified in plants the basic structure of that is on the lower left hand side you can see the different options that you have there um, 
the non-methylated versions without the uh, OCH3 group on are the most widespread. The chromophore is this delocalized conjugated pi system that spreads throughout most of the molecule. And those OH and OCH3 groups can vary and they provide that oxychromic effect. And you can see the practical result of that oxychromic effect in this diagram towards the bottom here, showing the six main anthocyanidins uh, with the different functional groups on, showing you the, the difference in uh, spectrum that you see, or the difference in the observed color of the different anthocyanins that are going from an orangey color over to uh, a violet color. Um, the other thing that can affect the shade of anthocyanins very distinctly, and this is an important property, is that of pH. So you can see on the upper right hand side the effects of pH in changing the species present in, uh, in an anthocyanin and therefore changing the colour. Another important family of colorants are carotenes and carotenoids. Um, these are so-called terpenoid family of colorants, so long polyene conjugated chain, and that long chain extending from one end of the molecule to the other is the chromophore. The terminal rings here with different functional groups on them, depending on the type uh, the specific molecule, have rather subtle oxychromic effects. Uh, important property is that that chain may degrade oxidatively in heat or in light, and it can be unstable to acids. In general, these, as you can see here, don't have any obviously significant uh, water solubilizing groups on them, so they tend to be water insoluble or fat soluble currents. And some very common ones here, alpha and beta carotene, xanthophils and lycopene. Chlorophyll is obviously an extremely well known colorant and here in the chlorophyll molecule we have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B with slightly different substitution up here on the molecule. The porphyrin ring or the chlorine ring here provides the conjugated system which makes up the chromophore and that's quite a common structure elsewhere in nature so that's seen, seen in haemoglobin in blood but also seen in synthetic colorants such as thalocyanins. Here in chlorophyll the nitrogen atoms complex to a central metal ion which has an oxychromic effect itself so in this case in this diagram we've drawn a, a magnesium in here a magnesium ion uh, which has an oxychromic effect. You can also get copper and sodium chlorophyllin. Copper replaces magnesium in the ring and sodium falls, uh, forms salt, salts of these carboxylic acid groups. These substituent uh, groups as we said are also oxychromic. Um, acid can remove the magnesium ion and hydrolyze the ester chain so that's a mechanism for instability and destroying the color and uh, it can also be alkali hydrolysis of the ester chain as well so some really important things that can happen to cause problems with stability here and heat on top of that can accelerate that decomposition let's have a look at another common color curcumin this is so-called diaryl heptanoid. Two aromatic rings joined by a seven carbon chain. So let's have a look here on uh, this diagram on the, on the, at, the, at the bottom here. So we have two aromatic rings on either end and seven carbon atoms in the chain. That delocalized pi system is essentially the chromophore. In fact, curcumin has two tautomeric forms, the keto and the enol, and the enol is more stable. It also has some minor components in there, so you have derivatives with one or both of the OCH3 groups missing. Um, so curcumin is insoluble in water, in, uh, which is acidic or neutral, but it's soluble in alkali. It's also slightly soluble in vegetable oil. It's unstable to light and to alkali and it's stable to heat. So important uh, physical properties is important to know when formulating curcumin. One thing that's worth remembering when dealing with natural color molecules is that they're not simply single clean molecules. 
They're very often and much more often mixtures of coloured species as well as other non-coloured material. They're often full of impurities with closely related structures, so structural analogues, and they're very often quite poorly characterised. So you're not always sure exactly what you've got. And it's worth remembering that when trying to come up with ideas and solutions is that yes, you'll have a good proportion of a particular molecule in there, but worth remembering you've got a load of other stuff in there as well that you may need to think about. Let's move on to thinking about the reasons for instability and looking at some differences in instability between natural and synthetic colours. So let's summarise how colour can be destroyed, changed or degraded. Well, heat, first of all, heat accelerates most chemical reactions, and that includes degradation reactions. Light, so the process of photocatalysis may occur. Photons of light may have a catalytic effect in a degradation reaction. pH, as we've already seen, excesses of hydrogen ions, so a low pH or OH minus light, high pH, may accelerate reactions such as hydrolysis. Oxidation or reduction, so oxidizing or reducing agents may attack certain chemical bonds in the molecule. There may be catalysis uh, by impurities such as metals that cause the molecule to degrade. And there may be physical interactions, so particles may aggregate, they may solubilize and they may precipitate and that can cause problems in terms of the color that is obtained. Let's look briefly at the distinction and the differences between natural and synthetic colours. Uh, and if you're used to dealing with synthetic colours, then natural colours can be quite significantly different. You don't have nearly as much control. You, in a sense, you have to accept what you're given. So natural colours and synthetic colours differ. One of the reasons is the variety of chromophores. There's a huge variety of synthetic chromophores available, and they've been designed and optimized for stability over the years, and it's taken many years of, of research to do that, but they've been optimized for stability to light, stability to heat, stability to oxidation, stability to pH, and for brilliance of, of color. So there's a huge process of optimization has gone into that. Um, there's also a huge degree of flexibility in the sorts of oxychromes that can be used to precisely tune the absorption spectrum and the hue of synthetic colors. So oxychromic group groups can be added or subtracted from molecules very easily during the synthetic process. Um, the physical pro properties of synthetic colours are also tuned precisely to give them, for instance, desired solubility in water or solubility in organic solvents or insolubility in the case of synthetic pigments, for instance. Synthetic colours are also made by well characterised and well controlled synthetic processes and it's very relatively straightforward to characterize the impurities that are produced and to purify and minimize the quantities of those impurities if that's desired. So characterization and purification uh, is significantly different and improved in the case of synthetic colors. And the safety profile, well, um, synthetic colors have been historically under quite heavy toxicological and regulatory scrutiny due to past historical incidents. For that reason, um, those colorants on the market now tend to be those which um, have got through that toxicological scrutiny uh, and are now assessed to be relatively safe to use. So let's look wider than the area of colours to, for, for ideas and for parallels in stability. So natural colours, are they the only products with stability problems? And other industries uh, have comparable stability challenges. So for instance, pharmaceuticals, agrochemicals, cosmetics and textiles all have challenges with formulating molecules that can be unstable. So we're going to look at those comparable stability challenges next before moving on to some industry approaches and answers to those challenges. Let's start with some of the challenges of pharmaceutical stability and many of the new so-called biologic active ingredients such as peptides. They're very sensitive molecules and they need 
to ensure that the, the 2D and 3D structure of those molecules remains intact, otherwise they won't work as intended. And they've got, that's got to remain intact throughout the processing through synthesis, formulation, storage, uh, and also in the body. There are also, on top of that, traditional small molecule active ingredients, less prone to that problem, but still potentially uh, chemically and physically unstable as well. The kinds of conditions that pharmaceutical molecules have to go through can be quite extreme. They have to be stable to some degree of heat, so body temperature at least, maybe more during processing, and extreme pH. So for instance, on digestion in the gastrointestinal tract, pH is very low, about two, uh, and that can cause uh, molecules such as these peptides to degrade. Um, got to have stability not only to pH, but also to oxidation and hydrolysis. Um, and we've got to get them to the active site where they do their job before that instability mechanism can act. On top of that, we often have particulate materials, as we do, for instance, for colours and for other uh, industrial products. And we've got to ensure physical stability by keeping those small particles well dispersed. We also have the issue very often of taste mask masking to consider, that many active ingredients in pharmaceuticals taste pretty bad, and uh, an amount of work goes into providing solutions that uh, prevent uh, the patient from experiencing that taste. Interestingly, when we talk about natural colour, there's also a trend towards natural colour for pharmaceutical preparations, and some natural colours, including some of the ones that we've shown earlier, are even being investigated for medicinal properties of their own. Let's move on to another industry, and this time we'll consider uh, agrochemicals. In the agrochemical area, there is a trend towards so-called biopesticides, and these can be natural extracts, they can be peptides or enzymes or proteins, and they can even be living organisms. So there's a whole range of different actives. Uh, that, that uh, have to be formulated and kept stable. These have often very similar challenges to pharmaceutical biologics. So here's an example of a, of a known um, bacterium, Bacillus subtilis, which secretes an antimicrobial pe peptide um, that can then um, suppress any toxins around the root that stop uh, beneficial bacteria from colonizing the soil. So there's an example of a bacterium that has to be formulated and it secretes an antimicrobial peptide. Chitazan is a natural substance that can be used as a plant growth in enhancer. It boosts the ability of plants to defend against fungal infections. Uh, and uh, that, the structure of that you can see there, and that has to be formulated as well. So there are naturally occurring molecules and even organisms in the agrochemical area uh, where, where stability can be an issue. In cosmetics, just as in food, there's a huge trend towards natural and the use of natural ingredients, but of course there's many different definitions of natural. Um, and in many ways the organic cosmetics movement parallels that that we, we see in the food area. So we may see, for instance, to be formulated a lot of different natural extracts and natural polymers and other plant-derived actives and compounds. And we, hit, we see the same issue that we do with uh, natural colours. So often these natural extracts are not very well defined chemically. They can be mixtures and there can be a big variability according to the source or the season in which the ingredients are obtained. And the stability of those natural ingredients, as we've seen with natural colours of all types, is an issue. So pH, chemical, the usual uh, culprits here, pH, chemical, heat, light, microbiology, and so on. Um, there is an issue, I think, with, with cosmetics. I mean, some, some of the properties, the undesirable properties that, that may occur, may not be immediately observed. So yes, we can tell if colour changes, if the perfume changes, or if a, a preservative isn't working. But some of the um, other properties, in terms of sensorial properties that cosmetic may give you, the loss of efficacy over time and due to instability may not always be immediately apparent, and that can be a challenge. Moving on to natural colours in that application, and some natural colours are approved in cosmetics. I won't go through that list 
one by one, but you can see there that the US FDA has an approved list of colorants, including some natural colors and the same with the EU as well. And again, as we would expect, these have similar issues of stability to light and pH and so on. Um, true pigments would be preferred um, because true pigments can often give you better stability, um, but these are often not available. Some in inorganic pigments are also used in cosmetics and also some lake pigments and lake pigments um, we'll come on to a little bit later. These are essentially uh, insoluble salts of, of natural colors that can be used. In textiles, well, t textiles have a long history of using natural colorants. That goes back to ancient times and the use of uh, colors such as indigo and the closely related pigment uh, or, or dye, Tyrian purple. These days, however, natural textile coloration is quite a niche, and, and the reasons for that are manyfold. Um, natural colors tend to have poor fastness, a relatively inadequate color palette, um, particularly missing brilliant shades and bright shades. Um, they have poor fixation properties on the textiles. Um, for for all, all different sorts of textile types, remember we've got to color things like cotton, polyester, nylon, and so on. So we've got to try and find colorants to, to color all of those different substrates. Um, there's economics as well. So the economics of mass coloration are such that uh, uh, using natural colors may not be economic. And then the use of land, land that could be used, for instance, for food, uh, might have to be turned over to coloring textiles. Another issue to consider is to give them adequate fixation and fastness on the textile, often rather toxic post-treatments have to be used. So for that reason, for those reasons, natural color, uh, coloration of textiles is quite niche at the moment. Um, usually soluble dyes are used. So for colors, coloration of textiles, um, there is printing with pigments and some dyes may be post-pigmented after application. So you've got things like VAT dyes, which are reduced soluble variants of a dye that can be applied onto a cloth. So indigo is a great example of that in their reduced form, their soluble form, and then oxidized by air to form the color molecule as particles trapped um, around the fibers of the textile. But in general, um, natural colors for uh, textile applications have similar fastness issues to other natural colorants. So we ask ourselves the question now, are natural colors the only products with stability problems? And let's look at some other industry approaches to stability challenges. And the first of those approaches actually is a family of different approaches which we can uh, group under the term encapsulation. So why might you try and encapsulate a colorant or another active species? First of all, obviously stability to provide it the stability that it doesn't have, to give you compatibility in the formulation, to give you some sort of controlled release properties, to release that active when you want it to be released, and to give you taste masking. So for instance, to wrap up an active molecule that doesn't taste good in something that doesn't taste so bad, to mask the taste of that. Now encapsulation can be carried out on a range of different length scales from the very small to the rather large. So at the molecular level, you can have uh, compounds such as cyclodextrins, which I've drawn up here on the, on the left-hand side, um, which can wrap themselves around molecules and protect or encapsulate them. We can move into nano-sized uh, nano capsules, up to micron-sized capsules, and even micro capsules, and, and every, every uh, layer in between is possible. Let's look at one example, uh, which is frequently used in cosmetics and drug delivery, and that's nano encapsulation with liposomes. So liposomes generally are formed of uh, phospholipids, and these can be synthetic or natural. These have a, a hydrophilic group on them, a phosphate group and a fatty hydrocarbon tail. And in solution, these can self-associate and form bilayers in the simplest state or micelles or liposomes. So what is a liposome? Here you are, you can actually see there's a cross section through a, a liposome here. It's essentially a capsule. So you have a, a cavity in the middle, you have a, a double layer here 
of the phospholipids. And you have there an environment for, for in principle, uh, wrapping up either within the fatty chains, which are colored yellow here, or, or in the inside, an active species. And here's a, here's a cut through where you can see an example uh, from a pharmaceutical uh, formulation example of where um, a liposome has been formed of this phospholipid bilayer and in between uh, in the lipophilic area the water hating or the fat loving part of the liposome you can see the drug molecules essentially dissolved in that area so that's one way of formulating encapsulating and protecting used in drug delivery and to some extent in cosmetics as well um, so for encapsulating and stabilizing stable uh, sensitive drug molecules to permit uh, stability during oral delivery where the low pH in the gastrointestinal tract would normally degrade active ingredients and indeed some people have tried to do this with natural colors here's an example from cosmetics where the sodium zinc chlorophyllin complex uh, was encapsulated within liposomes to give you uh, a topical delivery of those minerals copper and zinc which is quite an interesting way of doing it um, these are liposomes submicron liposomes as we can see here with a diameter below 350 nanometers and actually putting these things together is relatively straightforward we dissolve that uh, colorant in some relatively simple solvents which are then homogenized uh, together with the phospholipid which is naturally occurring lecithin in a high shear mixer and that creates a uniform dispersion with particles up to 350 nanometers inside size here's an example from a completely different area from inkjet printing with synthetic colors it's a hewlett packard patent whereby water insoluble dyes and pigments were wrapped up inside liposomes to give you improved properties so the problem being tackled here was that of agglomeration of pigments and dyes which was undesired and by wrapping them up in liposomes those properties were improved and again we can see the same sorts of materials being incorporated in here so the naturally occurring soy lecithin and other ingredients were fluidized at high pressure and then formulated further as an ink and the improvement in stability to sedimentation was noticed in that case and here's an interesting example uh, of natural color formulation with liposomes from the area of tattoos and here the desired example uh, is about making an erasable tattoo so the the product is formulated as a liposome so the dye of the pigment is formulated into a liposome and some of the phospholipids are named there uh, on that text that you see there and a whole range of different colors can be used and uh, claimed uh, the mechanism works by exposing the tattoo to light of a specific wavelength at which wavelength the liposomes become permeable the dye or the pigment then gets released from the liposome into the body and is then eliminated gradually by the body and the tattoo is then erased <laughs> moving down the length scale a little bit to zeolites 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 are molecular cages and in this example uh, a natural indigo colorant was formulated with a particular zeolite which is an inorganic organic hybrid pigment called silicolite um, and that improved the color durability to light and to temperature of the indigo essentially you're protecting it inside the cage and masking it from the effects that otherwise would occur and you can see then uh, how that has not been improved on the lower right hand side so there's an example of molecular encapsulation and a much more historic example also using indigo and, and very similar in a way so that in this case not not zeolite but an actual clay is used so sepiolite or paligorskite with the minerals here 
So natural clay mo molecules were used to incorporate uh, indigo uh, by the Mayas around 1,200 years ago. So this is nothing new. Here's the example of Maya blue, and that's the blue pigment in that mask on the right-hand side. That's essentially indigo, the same naturally occurring vegetable indigo encapsulated into a clay, giving it an improved permanence. There are techniques for micron scale encapsulation that are pretty well known and well established in uh, industries such as food, pharmaceutical and agrochemicals. Lots of different ways of doing it. One way which is quite popular, particularly in the food area, is that of complex coacivation or phase separation. And we've illustrated that diagrammatically with the lower four diagrams here. So first of all, you disperse an oil phase containing your active, that might be your colorant, for instance, in a solution of a hydrocolloid. So that might be something like a gelatin or some other natural polymer, which is surface active. Produce then, then a dispersion or an emulsion. You then precipitate that hydrocolloid around the oil phase droplets by reducing the solubility of the hydrocolloid. And that can be done in the case of gelatin by changing pH, but you might also do it by cooling, by reducing temperature, or by adding some sort of antisolvent. Then a second polymer is added, a certain second hydrocolloid, in this example gum arabic, another natural gum, um, which can then form a complex with the first polymer to form a, a more robust hydrocolloid. Then some cross-linking reaction it takes place to stabilize the capsule. So you've actually formed a polymer capsule around a droplet containing oil and the active substance such as the colorant. Um, and then, if necessary, then water can be removed by drying to produce dry capsules, or you can be left as a suspension. Typical sizes here are multiple microns, so 10 microns up to about 250 microns in size. Here's an example of preparing a water dispersible hydrophobic or aerophilic solid. And in this case, um, beta carotene was added to a solution of gelatin and sodium ascorbate. And that was then bead mill because it isn't soluble in uh, gelatin ascorbate water mixtures. So it's then bead milled to grind down the beta carotene. That milled suspension was then added to glucose sucrose. Um, in which the ascorbyl palmitate had been added, that's some sort of uh, surface active agent, uh, was then emulsified. And that essentially wraps the particles up, protects those milled particles so that you form a polymer. So these natural polymers then form a capsule around the beta carotene particles, and that protects them against recrystallization and crystal growth. As a result of that, you can produce really quite a high active content suspension, which you can keep as a suspension, as liquid suspension, or it can be uh, dried to produce a dry, a dry uh, powder containing particles of protective beta carotene. So in the next part, we're going to move on to some case studies of natural colours, curcumin, anthocyanins and others, uh, covering topics such as microemulsions. We're going to review possible approaches for stabilising natural colours, some pros and cons, and then think about the topic of knowledge sharing. So here's the first case study. It's curcumin again. And here what's happened is that curcumin has been stabilized by complexation with divalent metal ions. And in this case, you can see here on the right hand side, ions such as copper and zinc, magnesium, have all been used to stabilize curcumin. Uh, it turns out it's quite simple to do this. So this, these were produced by simple mechanical mixing of the curcumin with the metal salts and then extraction of those complexes with a, a solvent mixture of water and glycerol. And as you can see from the chart near the bottom there, this managed to achieve protection against chemical de degradation for a significant period of time. In this example, uh, 
anthocyanin was formulated as lake pigments and lake pigments are insoluble metal iron salts of naturally occurring or synthetic pigments or synthetic dyes. Essentially, essentially what you're doing here is turning a dye, a soluble dye, into an insoluble pigment by crystallizing as a metal salt. Uh, in this case, uh, a so-called biomimicry process was used and the products are being marketed for cosmetics, things like hair dyes and so on. The anthocyanin lakes are also known from previous patent examples. So 2005, there's a Christian Hansen pattern, patent which covers topics such as a spray drying process for cabbage extract, which is the anthocyanin, to which aluminium sulfate has been added uh, until a blue precipitate was formed. So that's the lake pigment. Uh, and so uh, it was found that that was a, uh, a good pigment to use. In the second example, some polymers were added. So a sugar syrup and some natural gum, gum arabic were added to encapsulate those particles as they were formed. Uh, the suspension was then bead milled uh, to submicron sizes. So you've got examples here of uh, formation of aluminium salts to produce insoluble lakes. And in the example of a more recent example of 2014 from Nestle, you can see that they've tried to tackle the perennial problem of blue natural food coloration, in this case for uh, children's sweets. Here they, again, they're talking about using anthocyanins together with particular metal ions. And here are some examples from the 2014 patent. We've got spray drying again, uh, cabbage extract, tannic acid, uh, ferrous sulfate in this case was the uh, was the salt, the metal salt, adding maltodextrin and to, to stabilize and spray drying to, to form a pow uh, powder of the anthocyanin lake. Molecular encapsulation can be carried out using uh, particular compounds such as cyclodextrins and cyclodextrins are naturally occurring cyclic sugar molecules. On the inside of the donut shaped molecule is a hydrophobic cavity and that can be used to as a, as a host for guest molecules such as natural colors and the outside of the molecule is water soluble. So you can effectively turn a water insoluble molecule into a water soluble one, whilst at the same time protecting it in that cavity. And here are some examples from publication from 2011. In the case of curcumin, that was uh, encapsulated using two beta cyclodextrin molecules, uh, and Bixin was encapsulated in a one-to-one -one complex. And so these complexes are stoichiometric, either you have two or one sugar or cyclodextrin molecule per, uh, per guest molecule. And the sorts of benefits that you get here quoted are intensification of colour, presumably you're keeping the colourant molecules apart and giving you that sharper absorption that gives you a more intense colour and increased water solubility as we've said. In the case of paprika, it was found that emulsification could have a stabilizing effect. So particular emulsifiers were used, natural emulsifiers, and also natural antioxidants were also included. The main dyes you can see here on the right hand side, capsanthin and capsarubin are the natural dyes that uh, form the, the color for paprika. So we are reducing the degradation uh, according to a particular mechanism uh, electron transfer, uh, rendering them less likely to be uh, oxidized from atmospheric oxygen. So that was the mechanism and improved properties were seen. Let's move on to microemulsions. And before we go through this example, it's worth saying what microemulsions are. So microemulsions are somewhat different from conventional coarse emulsions. Microemulsions have a much finer particle size 10 to 50 nanometers in diameter and, and rather than regarding these particles as droplets it's probably better to regard them as kind of swollen micelles with close packed surfac surfactants around the outside on the inside will be an oil phase containing the active ingredient 
The uh, significant benefit of microemulsions is that unlike conventional emulsions, microemulsions are thermodynamically stable. So these sorts of products can be much more stable physically over time. And in this case, uh, the colorant uh, used was again curcumin, and this was formulated in peppermint oil as the oil phase and using lecithin as the emulsifier. And you can see from the diagram at the bottom, you've got a considerably increased uh, shelf life uh, in terms of the degradation of the color shade over time uh, by formulating as this microemulsion. So you don't obviously get physical stability from having a thermodynamically stable microemulsion, but you've also got chemical stability by trapping this uh, molecule, this colorant molecule inside the oil phase and preventing it then from being for instance, uh, attacked by, by ultraviolet light. So let's summarize the sorts of approaches that you would go through when stabilizing colors. And the first thing that we talked about and learned is that you have to know what you want and also know how you will know when you've got it or not got it. So this is all about the understanding the properties that you want to control the changes in those properties that can happen and how they can happen, the measurement, understanding if, if something's changed, how do I know it's changed? So the measurements, the tolerances and the test methods are extremely important here. Important then uh, uh, under point two is to understand and know what you've got. So the color, the impurities, the physical state and the matrix all have to be understood well. Uh, and so you're building up a really good picture of your system by understanding the various components and what can happen to them. And related to that is understanding the failure mechanisms. And these failure mechanisms can be physical, they can be chemical, as we've said. So understand what might happen to your colorant uh, due to light, due to pH, due to oxidation, etc. Really understand those failure me mechanisms. The next step is to try and systematically list through the options that you've got for stabilization. And those options, remember, as we've given some examples from other other industries, those options might not come directly from the world of colors or from the industry that you're in at the moment. So look around and look outside for your options. Then review those options against various criteria, feasibility, cost, complexity, side effects, and so on. So think about systematically reviewing the options and then select, test, and evaluate those options um, in, in, in order of priority. And although sometimes under time pressures, it's very tempting to jump in at 0.5 or 0.6 and, and, and test out a few options without thinking about what you're doing. Actually, if you can put yourself some time aside to work your way through this process and, and do that understanding phase in those first points, one to three here, that's really, really important. If you've got time, really understand your system. And then when you come to listing your options, you'll probably have a wider range of options and more relevant options to test and evaluate. So let's summarize some of the options for stabilizing colors that we've gone through already. So a cost effective and simple way of doing this, as we've seen, if the molecule is appropriate, is metal iron complexation. The cons, well, acceptability of those metals may be questionable at times. And there is plenty, as we've seen, of existing IP in this area to uh, consider. Laking, very similarly, is cost effective and relatively simple. You're making a simple salt of the natural color. Again, you have to consider the same factors. So what, what metals are acceptable, if any, uh, and what existing IP is there. Antioxidants can be formulated into the product. These can be cost effective and again, relatively simple. Uh, but it's very specific to colors that are susceptible to oxidation and there are relatively few acceptable options that you could consider here. Micro emulsions we've seen, again, pretty low complexity and you don't need lots and lots of additives to do this, but the acceptability really depends critically on the active. Does it have the right physical properties to be formulated into a micro emulsion? You need to think also about carefully choosing the surfactants that are gonna give you a stable product. Macro encapsulation, so those large capsules, very well established technology for things like pharmaceuticals, food and so on. Um, but of course, these are very, very large capsules and they may be not suitable for what you want to do in, in, in the end use. So think about that one, but again, not suitable for everyone. Micro encapsulation, relatively straightforward, you know, a few steps to follow, but these are well established. 
The issue is here, there's quite a lot of existing IP. You need complex choice of additives uh, to put into your recipe. So that might need to be something to, to, to think, think about there. Molecular complexation, we've seen some examples of both organic and inorganic molecular complexes. Again, relatively low quantities of additives required. But again, only certain molecules are suitable for this sort of approach. And there's a very narrow choice of acceptable additives. In fact, we've probably covered most of them in the few slides that we've shown you in this presentation. Nano encapsulation, again, effective. Again, a low additive quantities required, but it's complex. There's existing IP uh, and there's a relatively reduced choice of acceptable additives. The final point that we wanted to make really was to think about leveraging knowledge from elsewhere and using that expertise that's been gathered in other sectors. So the, this challenge of stabilizing natural colors has a lot of parallels in other industries. So if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, the industries of, of agrochemical pesticides, cosmetics, textiles, and so on. Really, there are lots of examples of stabilization mechanisms that people have used for analogous problems. So have a look there, see what you can find, uh, and look for parallels in the physical mechanism or the chemical me me mechanism for instability. And take some time to find out about those challenges in those industries and there are all sorts of ways of doing that. Obviously, there are things like conferences and trade shows, there are trade publications and, and scientific journals, and there, and there are open innovation events and seminars. So take some time to look outside your own industry to search for potential solutions to your problems. So that's all that we wanted to cover today. And thank you very much once again for listening to us. Here are our contact details and you're more than welcome at any time to get in touch with us uh, to see whether we can help you with your formulation challenges. So from I formulate once again, thank you and goodbye.